Uh, hi everybody. Uh, now this session we are going to welcome uh, MP Michael Dandy from Australian Parliament, and I'm Masatoshi Murakami, a former member of the House of Representatives Japan. And uh, uh, please uh, let me introduce uh, MP Michael Dandy. Uh, Michael Dandy MP is a senior member of the Australian Labour Party, opposition in the Australian Federal Parliament, and he was elected as member for Melbourne Ports in 1998 and was re-elected in 2001, 2004, 2007, 2010, 2013, and 2016, six times. Uh, since his election uh, to Federal Parliament, his main areas of interest have been uh, foreign affairs, defence, uh, national security, immigration, electoral matters, human rights and the environment. He has also been active on the issue of child care in uh, inner uh, urban areas and Australia's rollout of a national uh, broadband network. In the parliament, Mr. Dabby uh, served as a one of two opposition uh, whips, parliament secretary to the opposition leader, parliament secretary for the arts, was a member uh, of the uh, of the Parliament Electoral uh, Matters Committee and became deputy chairs of the Joint uh, Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, chair of the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Migration and chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Thank you very much. <laughs> and currently, Mr. Dabi is deputy chair of the Standing. Uh, committee on Treaties and Deputy Chair of both the Australian Tibet Parliament Friendship Group and the Australian USA Parliament French, uh, Friendship Group. Uh, this is the uh, introduction. And please uh, uh, have a presentation on the Chinese uh, democratization. Thank you very much. Sorry for the, uh, another speaker. I'm sure you've had many sessions, and uh, I've uh, made a big effort in this speech to uh, do some very detailed research. So uh, I'm sorry in advance. I'm apologising to you for uh, boring you with details, but the, um, the speech that I've prepared is uh, um, quite detailed, and I, I want to. Uh, uh, thank, first of all, uh, Dr. Wang and Initiatives for China, the National Endowment for Democracy, and all of the worthy institutions that have uh, supported this uh, conference here in uh, Japan. It's a very big honour for me to, uh, uh, to be here, and uh, perhaps I'm uh, not as prominent as uh, uh, Mr. Bannon, who I believe you had uh, uh, today, but... Um, uh, in Australia, uh, the issue of the rise of Chinese power, the Chinese government's power, uh, is a very big issue. It will surprise you. And uh, uh, that's the background, the uh, mindset from which I'm coming. It's a big issue in my country, and of course, um, for countries throughout Asia, uh, the rise of China is a very important issue. Uh, China is a great country, a great civilization. I don't have to tell you that. Um, uh, and many people will feel great pride in the economic progress uh, that uh, that country has made. But today I want to look at uh, China's military build-up in the last 10 years, its expansion of bases from Pakistan, Sri Lanka and the Horn of Africa, an overview of the island build-up in the South China and East China Sea, uh, the latest doctrine by Xi Jinping on uh, Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Xinjiang and the political influence operations that go with the growth in China's military power um, in, uh, in Asia. So I want to begin with the most difficult which is the military uh, issues. Now I've pre prepared a speech and it has many links to it so I've, all of the assertions that I'm making, um, hopefully you'll be able to see the links um, 
China's military spending has increased significantly over the last decade. It's not risen as much as GDP. Uh, military build-up has commenced from a low base compared to uh, other countries. States such as the United States and Russia uh, have, a, have long operated sophisticated militaries. China, uh, protesting its peaceful rise, has now acquired a military commensurate with its economic weight. Estimates of Chinese military spending are bedeviled by lack of transparency. China's official uh, figure is dwarfed by external estimates. For example, in 2015, the official uh, defence budget of China was $144.2 billion. However, the US State Department argued that China actually spent $180 billion. The International Institute for Strategic Studies estimated the figure to be $193 billion and the Stockholm Institute for, Re for Peace Research arrived at the sum of $214 billion. So these are huge amounts. Uh, I don't have to tell you uh, the effect of, of them. Uh, let's first look at the People's Liberation Army, uh, in the Navy in particular. The Navy, I, I would argue, has benefited the most from this huge growth in uh, military uh, spending. It's acquired uh, a modern uh, Soviet-era aircraft carrier, uh, the, the uh, Liaoning, uh, which is already at sea. Uh, it serves as a test for China's forthcoming indigenous aircraft carriers, of whom it's estimated that there will be six. China is also modernising its surface fleet uh, to defend the carriers. Uh, China's Type 55 cruiser is uh, proceeding rapidly and carries 122 vertical launch missile cells equipped only uh, by the US Ticonderoga cruiser and dwarfing, for instance, Australia's uh, Hobart class destroyers, which only have 48 cells in each ship. Uh, a key characteristic of uh, Beijing's naval procurement is to build uh, multiple classes of vessels, uh, refining their capabilities in each generation. This has allowed substantial growth in platforms over the last decade. Uh, the Congressional Research Service has highlighted in 2007 China had 13 destroyers and 16 frigates. By 2017, the number has risen to 24 and 40 respectively. Uh, China is also, as you know, modernising its uh, submarine force. According to the US Department of Defence, uh, the current force comprised of five nuclear attack submarines four nuclear-powered ballistic missile boats and 54 diesel attack submarines is likely to expand to a force of 78 by 2020. Uh, the Air Force. The PLA Air Force has enjoyed considerable support. It's advanced uh, now to fifth-generation aircraft. The Chengdu J-20 entered service recently. China is also developing a second fifth-generation aircraft, the Shenyang J-31 which regrettably has uh, reported uh, benefit from information, uh, let's be frank about it, um, uh, pinched from the American uh, F-35 program. Um, one of the strange things about um, China's uh, uh, aircraft is that uh, it's been frustrated by an inability to build a, a reliable military jet engine. Um, a similar growth has uh, taken place in the People's Liberation Army rocket forces and the thing that concerns um, people in uh, other navies and around the world is the deploy deploying of the JF-21D and the DF-26 which have been called carrier killers uh, and they're missiles as big as a bus um, which uh, can be shot from land. Um, there is some doubt about China's ability to locate US carriers and successfully striking with these missiles. Um, the, now, what is the purpose of um, this uh, military modernization? Um, uh, Beijing's military modernization serves President Xi, Xi's some um, political objectives, I, I believe. Drawing on historical grievances promoted by the Communist Party's narrative of a century of humiliation in which China was dismembered by European and Japanese imperialism, he has promoted his China dream, which aims to achieve, quote, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and is characterised by a considerable degree of nationalism. 
A recent study showed that Beijing's military contingencies to attack and suppress Taiwan. Many will wonder whether President Trump would do, uh, perhaps we could ask Mr. Bannon uh, uh, if uh, he's still here in uh, Tokyo, uh, whether President Trump would do what President Clinton did in uh, 1998 and place two carrier battle groups uh, to prevent a cross-strait attack on Taiwan. China's military modernization supports a view that the Communist Party is keen to convey, and that is that a strong China can no longer be bullied by foreign powers. Elements of hard power, such as aircraft carriers and fighter jets, carry a potent symbolism in this regard by demonstrating that China has arrived as a great power. So it has a domestic impact in impressing young people um, uh, at home as well. Military modernization also serves uh, the Communist Party's foreign policy. For example, by acquiring missiles capable of striking US forces in Japan and Korea and making it extremely costly for US aircraft carrier battle groups to approach uh, Chinese shores or Taiwan, China's military force structure is designed to dissuade the United States from projecting force uh, against China, uh, particularly in uh, the Taiwan uh, situation. This supports the domestic goal of conveying to the Chinese public a sense of growing strength uh, uh, and invulnerability of the communist leadership. It also serves a way of attempting to decouple Washington from East Asian affairs. A, uh, a very serious prospect that concerns people uh, throughout Asia, including Australia. And perhaps is the reason why my colleague, the um, a defence Minister in the Opposition has signalled that Australia for the first time will, uh, uh, if a Labor government is elected, be interested in the quadrilateral arrangement with Japan, India uh, and the United States to uh, oppose some of this uh, 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 rising uh, military power. Uh, <coughs> But uh, we, uh, I believe Beijing is using its South China Sea disputes as a means of demonstrating that America is no longer willing to risk a military confrontation to sustain its own leading position in the Asian strategic order and thereby conceding leadership to China. If, for example, states such as Japan, the Philippines and Australia begin to doubt the will and ability of the US to use force to uh, defend uh, their interests uh, against Beijing, they may become more willing to defer to uh, Mr Xi Jinping and the Communist Party of China's preferences. Given the US relies on regional bases to project power into the region, here in Japan of course, uh, in Australia, in the Philippines, uh, should US allies uh, doubt Washington staying in power with China, America's position in the region um, uh, will become more difficult. The continuation, uh, and again this is a uh, challenge for Mr. Bannon and uh, the current American administration of freedom of navigation exercises, FONOPS as they're called in the South China Sea, is a key test of US resolve. Uh, the modernization of China's military, uh, it's already got the largest navy in Asia, and enhances its ability to project force within its region, um, showing states such as Vietnam and the Philippines uh, its power. For example, in July 2017, it was reported that Vietnam had ordered a Spanish firm that was exploring gas in the disputed South China Sea waters to leave the area after China threatened to attack Vietnamese bases if the exploration continued. Recently, um, the Philippines ceased construction of shelters for fishermen on a sandbar in the Philippines occupied Titu Islands and the Spratlys in response to uh, Beijing's demands. Now, the, the next area I want to look at is the expansion of uh, Beijing's military bases in Pakistan, Sri Lanka and the Horn of Africa and what they mean. The first overseas military base um, by, uh, of Beijing is located in the African state of Djibouti. The 36 hectare base is located to the southwest of the Dorala multi-purpose port uh, under construction by China State Construction Engineering Corporation and is located, uh, ironically, not distant from Cape Lemonia, 
the only permanent US military base in Africa. Um, China has a 10 year lease on what it calls a logistic base. Construction started in March 2016 and the base opened in August this year. Our satellite imagery shows, quote, a massive fortress able to easily accommodate over a brigade strength uh, force, uh, adding that it would allow China to monitor all shipping movements through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, as well as exert influence in the African continent. The base contains numerous storage barracks, an ammunition point, an office complex, a heliport. Uh, the base perimeter consists of four layers of fencing and walls with roads built in between for security patrols. So China uh, plans to set up an expeditionary force in Djibouti, ready for use uh, to respond to any crisis threatening the numerous economic and commercial interests in Africa and the Maritime Silk Road, uh, part of uh, uh, Premier Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road initiative linking uh, China to Europe. India has also expressed concerns about this base. Uh, President Xi Jinping has recently spoken to PLO troops in Djibouti by video. So he actually, uh, they're not just there, he, he uh, addressed them uh, by video and urged them to promote peace and stability. China uh, is also uh, busy developing the port of Gwadar in Pakistan, um, part of an enormous $50 billion China-Pakistan economic corridor a key element of the One Belt, One Road initiative. China will enjoy a 50-year lease over the port. In November 2016, it was declared that China would deploy naval ships along the Pakistan, with Pakistan naval <coughs> vessels to safeguard Gwadar port and trade routes. Uh, China handed over two ships to the Pakistan Navy for Gwadar's security. There are also concerns that Beijing is continuing to have an interest in Sri Lanka, particularly uh, the ports in that country that China will seek to establish some sort of military base on the island. In July 2017, Sri Lanka signed a 1.1 billion deal, deal with uh, Beijing for the control and development of a, of a southern deep sea port of Humboldt Humbo Tota. Uh, under the proposal, a state-run Chinese company will have a 99-year lease on the port and about 1,500 acres nearby for an industrial zone. The government has given assurances that China will run only commercial operations from the port on the main shipping route between Asia and Europe. Uh, Hambutata port overlooking the Indian Ocean is expected to play a key role in the One Belt, One Road initiative, otherwise known as the New Silk Road. Um, in 2014, the PLA Navy, uh, along with uh, submarine support, support ship docked uh, at the Chinese-run Colombo International Container Terminal in Sri Lanka. And uh, this is again part of the picture that uh, observers note. Um, some people have called this the string of pearls. Um, so China is establishing uh, military bases uh, throughout uh, the region that strategists uh, from India to Australia call the string of pearls. Uh, let me have a, give you a short overview of the uh, island build-up in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. China claim, claims to islands and numerous maritime zones in the South China Sea are based on the Nine Dash Line, which made its debut in the late 1930s. The Dash Line encompasses 90% of the South China Sea and extends across most of the exclusive economic zones granted to other states under the 1982 United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. The People's Republic of China has nonetheless progressively intensified its campaign to secure acceptance uh, of these waters and islands as part of its uh, uh, national territory. So in July 2012, China created a prefecture level city named Sunsha City, located on Woody Island um, uh, in the Paracels. It uh, nominally administers several island groups and undersea atolls in the South China Sea, including the Spratly Islands, the Parasols, Macclesfield, Bank, Scarborough Shoal, and a number of other ungrouped features, all from this new prefecture uh, uh, capital, Sunshine City. 
Foreign reaction to the declaration was not positive. The United States Department of State put, uh, called the change of the administrative status of the territory unilateral, and the move has received criticisms from nations engaged in the South China Sea dispute with uh, China, particularly the Philippines and Vietnam. In recent years, China has uh, utilised a continuing program of island building uh, uh, as the means by which to convince competing countries that China is the rightful sovereign of all of this maritime uh, area. Under Xi Jinping, the program escalated. The island building program ramped up quickly in August 2014 and was declared completed by uh, June 2015. It appears to have caught uh, the previous Obama administration in the US unawares and was ineffectively responded to by the uh, US administration. Um, I have to point out that 50% of the world's maritime trade uh, to Japan, to Korea, to Taiwan, indeed to China itself, goes through this zone. And uh, for it suddenly to go from an international sea to the national uh, sovereignty of uh, Beijing has many effects on uh, the free trade for which all of us uh, uh, benefit so much. The Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, um, probably uh, a group um, almost as good as China initiatives, um, uh, <laughs> said that since 2014, China has substantially expanded its ability to monitor and project power through the South China Sea via the construction of dual civilian military bases at its outposts in the disputed Spratling parasols. These include new radar and communications arrays, airstrips, hangars to accommodate combat aircraft, shelters meant to house missile platforms and deployments of uh, mobile surface-to-air and anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, particularly at the Woody Island in the parasols. Um, MT, um, which doesn't have as catchy a name as the China initiatives, uh, also provides a useful map showing how these capabilities overlap in the South China Sea. And um, hopefully the uh, English language copy of this speech has got all of these links, so the maps that I'm talking about and the uh, um, statements by independent organisations like the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative will all be there for you to see. Um, China dismisses concerns by its neighbours. Uh, um, uh, Xi Jinping said, I want to reiterate that China building facilities, including deploying necessary and appropriate national defence installations, is exercising um, our sovereign right to, to be recognised in international law. Let us not forget that ASEAN, in a lawful and peaceful way, tried to respond to uh, uh, Beijing's aggression by an appeal to the UN-mandated court which arbitrates disputes under the law of the sea. China has continued to ignore the ruling by the hard permanent court of arbitration which in 2016 explicitly rejected Beijing's claims to the seas with its nine dotted line. The Asian Mar Maritime Transparency Initiative again says <coughs> the tribunal invalidated Beijing's claim to ill-defined historical rights through the nine dash line and found that Scarborough Shoal is a rock entitled only to 1.2 mile territorial sea and surprised many observers by ruling on the legal status of every feature in the Spratly Islands raised by the Philippines. It found that none of the Spratlys, including the largest natural features, Itu Aba, and others, were legally islands because they cannot sustain a stable human community or independent economic life. As such, they are entitled only to territorial seas not economic zones or continental shelves. Of the seven Spratly Islands occupied by China, the court ruled uh, that Johnson Reef, Quaternary Reef, Fiery Cross Reef and Gavin Reef are rocks, and the Hughes Reef and Mischief Reef are below water at high tide, and therefore generate no maritime entitlements of their own. It also ruled that Cannon Reef is a low tide elevation, and etc. So, uh, now we have the China Coast Guard vessels maintaining a near constant presence in all of these uh, um, um, islands, um, including in Lushona Shoals off the coast of Malaysia's Sarawak Island. That's as far south as Malaysia, um, over a thousand kilometres distant from internationally recognised Chinese territory. Um, 
and uh, ominously, uh, this, this uh, pattern isn't at an end. China has just unveiled a new dredging ship capable of creating islands um, such as those Beijing has already built in the disputed South China Sea. And they have a uh, vessel, a magic island maker, magic island maker, uh, that institutes, uh, that designed it. Uh, the vessel was unveiled on the eve of President Trump's recent visit to, uh, to Asia. So now let me turn to another hard issue. Uh, the uh, Xi Jinping doctrine on Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Xinjiang. In addition to pursuing expansive actions in the South China Sea, uh, the uh, Communist administration in Beijing has also stepped up repression within the PRC and strengthened reactions uh, to events in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Again, I probably won't have to tell this to all of you here. You're, you're very much aware of it. President Xi launched a campaign to tighten China's grip on religious communities across China since 2016. Against that back backdrop, the United Front Work Department, the agency within the Chinese Communist Party that oversees China's religious affairs, amongst others, has vowed to sinicize religions in China. On the sidelines of the CCP's 19th Nation, uh, National Party Congress on October 20, uh, Zhang uh, Yiyong, the executive uh, deputy director of the United Front Department, explained uh, what uh, this sinicizing um, religious affairs meant. Uh, he said that the CCP adhered to the goal of sinicizing religions in China and had made socialist core values playing a leading role in the religious community. In the next step, Zhang added, China will keep cracking down uh, on acts such as taking advantage of religion to harm national security, promoting extremism for terrorist activities, and, quote, endangering national unity. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama told me uh, recently that one of the surprising effects of the suppression of uh, Buddhism in uh, uh, Tibet has been across the Himalaya belt, the, and including uh, into China, the spread of Buddhism. So um, one of the statistics, and some of our Tibetan friends may be able to uh, enlighten us further, are the claim that there are 400 million Buddhists uh, practicing in China. Someone else told me that there are 100 million Christians uh, practicing uh, in China. Uh, as I understand it, there are only 83 million members of the Communist Party. So um, one can see if one's looking at numbers, um, uh, why sinicizing religions might be something that the United Front Department is concerned about. Um, China has continued with a strong stance against the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government in exile. Governments globally have been warned to speak with and act with caution and give full consideration to their friendship with China and their respect for Chinese sovereignty when considering even meeting with the Dalai Lama. In Xinjiang, um, the Chinese leadership has pursued draconian measures uh, accompanying massive anti-terror rallies in Xinjiang. Tens of thousands of heavily armed troops have poured into the streets of Xinjiang and President Xi has vowed to wage a people's war on terror uh, against militants. Uh, President Xi also wants to build a great wall of steel in Xinjiang. All sorts of restrictions have been imposed on the Turkic people of Xinjiang. In Hong Kong, uh, uh, the Chinese and uh, the Beijing administration has pursued a policy of increasing PRC influence. Again, I'm probably telling you some material that you know very well. Uh, Beijing State Council released a 15,000 word white paper spelling out what it called the accurate understanding of one country, two systems in June 2014. Issued at a time when Hong Kong was debating political reform to achieve universal suffrage, for the Chief Executive in 2017, this white paper said Beijing enjoys comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong, while the city was given a high degree of autonomy to run its affairs only as authorised by Beijing. The paper also listed at least nine types of power that Beijing enjoys over Hong Kong as stipulated by the Basic Court. Street demonstrations uh, against further inroads by Beijing into Hong Kong's autonomy have marked the last few years. Of course, we all know of the uh, 
famous young people from the Umbrella Movement who rejected uh, Beijing's opposition to the rule of law. I might say for uh, Westerners, uh, for other people in Asia, these young people in Hong Kong, uh, as people of Taiwan, um, are an example of the fact that um, it's incorrect to say that uh, people of Chinese ethnic uh, background can't be involved in democracy. Ma manifestly uh, not true in Taiwan, uh, where there are peaceful changes of government, uh, something that uh, many countries in the world admire in any political system. And again, uh, the young people of, uh, uh, of Hong Kong uh, have many people around the world's um, uh, admiration. At the 19th uh, Congress, President Xi set, set his course for Hong Kong and Macau um, uh, <coughs> and uh, said that uh, the two cities with a high autonomy uh, uh, might be uh, further restricted uh, and China appears willing to kill the great commercial benefits of grants in Hong Kong's legal system which enhances Western investor confidence, uh, not just in Hong Kong, but investments made in Hong Kong to the mainland. Uh, China under uh, President Xi Jinping has increasingly pursued efforts uh, to influence the politics and economics of neighbours of Southeast Asia and the Pacific as an aspect of the overall program to com uh, compete with the influence of the United States globally. And here I want to focus on an area you may not all be so familiar with, but I think is very much uh, tied with the growth of military power. This is hard power, this is not soft power, this is this is a, a very deliberate change in tactics that we've seen in the last uh, period under the, uh, the new president. Uh, in June 2017, the New York Times and The Economist featured stories on China's political influence in Australia as an example. The New York Times headline uh, asked, are Australian politics too easy to corrupt? Good question. While The Economist sarcastically uh, refer to China as the metal country, not middle, metal. You know, that means when you interfere in uh, other places. The two articles were reacting to an investigation by the biggest um, left-wing uh, media, Fairfax Media, and the Australian Broadcasting Commission into the extent of China's political interference in Australia uh, that built on inquiries by um, uh, ASIO, the Security Service and the Department of Prime Minister of Cabinet. Now, if any of you have, uh, I'm sure you do have access to Google, it's important to go back and have a look. Uh, there is an extraordinary program um, on Four Corners. It's called Four Corners um, on China's political uh, influence in Australia as an example of what uh, Beijing is doing uh, all over the world, but particularly uh, here in Asia. Uh, such efforts uh, have not solely been directed at Australia and in many, many examples of efforts to influence countries around the region. The avenues of influence are diverse and can be divided into the following spheres. The key concept of China foreign policy which links party and state organisations is, as you all know, the United Front. And in my view, this parallels something from the 1930s, the Russian-controlled Comintern of old. The United Front is original, uh, a Leninist tactic of strategic allowances, alliances, but it now operates beyond China's borders. The CCP's efforts to influence the overseas Chinese population has helped extend uh, Beijing's global influence and to expand its economic agendas. Post-1989, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's policies were designed to discourage the Chinese diaspora from supporting dissidents uh, to reduce the impact of the Taiwan democratic model as well as to draw patriotic sentiments from overseas Chinese to get them to assist in China's economic and political development. Just like uh, the Soviet controlled communist international of old, in the 1930s, everyone knew about the activities of the Comintern. Everyone spoke about the Comintern. Uh, today's uh, equivalent, the United Front Work Department, um, operate under diplomatic cover as members of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, use their role to guide United Front activities outside, 
China working with politicians and other high-profile individuals, Chinese, com uh, Chinese community organisations, student organisations, and sponsoring Chinese language media and cultural activities, and in future years, we'll undoubtedly read stories of the, um, these people in the United Front Department through all of these organisations and uh, 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 fronts, um, giving stories exactly like the famous stories in the 1930s and 40s, uh, which you may be unfamiliar with, called, um, that some of them are called the Rotskapelle, which means, it's a German word, which means the Red Orchestra, uh, where Russian agents orchestrated political movements across all of these countries. So I fully expect in the next uh, 20 or 30 years to read stories about uh, the Chinese equivalent of the Rotskapelle. Uh, the uh, United Front work uh, not only serves foreign policy goals, but sometimes can be used as a cover for intelligence activities. Even more than his predecessors, uh, President Xi has led a massive expansion of efforts to shape foreign public opinion in order to influence the decision making of foreign governments and societies, just like uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, full spectrum warfare, the old Soviet do doctrine of active measures seems to have been added to China's armoury. Um, uh, thus, uh, uh, we saw a revitalised CCTV, rebranded in 2016 as China Global Television, providing the CCP line to the outside world, emphasising business uh, as well as politics, uh, via 24 hour satellite broadcasts and social media. At the same time, China Radio International and the Xinhua uh, News Service have cornered niche foreign radio, television, and online platforms via mergers and partnership arrangements. China Daily, uh, the CCP's English language newspaper, uh, has arrangements to publish supplements in major newspapers around the world, and I can tell you they do. And uh, uh, many of the failing uh, Western newspapers um, uh, that have problems with circulation, a supplement from China Daily um, is uh, looked forward to as a good economic supplement to, uh, to their activities. Some of them of these newspapers have the decency to say that these supplements are not produced uh, by independent journalists, but in fact by uh, 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 Beijing media. Recently in her study, uh, Magic Weapons, China's Political Influence Activities under Xi Jinping, Anne-Marie Brady has examined the efforts by China to influence regional neighbours and summed up influence, uh, avenues of influence as well as uh, policies pursued as, as follows. One, bring together the hearts and power of overseas Chinese. This is Ms. Brady's summary of what uh, the United Front Department is doing. Uh, the ambitious strategy to harness overseas Chinese populations for CCP current economic and political agenda, build on existing practices and, and take them to a new level of ambition. Uh, monitor the local Chinese community via community organisations to coordinate this work. Cherry pick which groups to work with and establish uh, overseas Chinese service centres. Sponsor and support the emergence of new United Front organisations to represent overseas Chinese, recognising that overseas Chinese communities are diverse people and flexibility is required to establish a positive working relationship with them. Avoid directly interfering in uh, Chinese community affairs in other countries unless there is a situation that directly affects China's political interests, such as the whistleblower uh, red capitalist, um, Miles Kwok, whose international campaign to expose corruption and espionage activities of the Beijing government at the highest level has prov provoked a massive counterattack. Other doctrines that Ms. Brady says that the United Front Department is, is um, working on is unite ethnic Chinese communities through nurturing and subsidised authorised Chinese cultural activities. So when um, some beautiful um, uh, Chinese cultural uh, presentation comes to Australia or to, uh, to India or wherever, you give it to the uh, pro-Beijing community organisation to enhance their credibility and to enhance the message. Uh, encourage wealthy overseas Chinese who are politically acceptable to the PRC government to subsidise activities which support uh, China's political agenda. And this is the area in Australia and I believe other places that has caused uh, uh, 
but many people will be hot to be uh, very opposed. So um, there will be political donations given by people who are acceptable to, uh, uh, to China, to major political parties to try and influence them in the right direction. Away. And I see my friend uh, Kinzon sitting down the front here and she'll be very familiar with that. Um, uh, now, the next doctrine that um, uh, they, Ms. Brady talks about is make the foreign serve China. In 2013, the National Conference on CCP Propaganda and Thought, um, Xi Jinping utilised a well known saying of Mao Zedong to make the past serve the present, but make the foreign serve China, to sum up his administration's back to the future approach to governance, traditional CCP policies of utilising people to people, party to party, and now PRC enterprise to foreign enterprise relations in order to co opt foreigners to support and promote China's foreign policy goals. Now, there are a number of Chinese agencies, um, you can read them in the speech that are involved in this. Um, and uh, uh, they do various things like strengthen party to party links, build a global network of strategic partners, appoint foreigners with access to political power to high profile roles in Chinese companies, um, on Chinese funded entities in the host country. Um, uh, for instance, on the, uh, the board of the Huawei uh, Corporation uh, in Australia, uh, they were trying to make uh, uh, inroads into uh, bidding for the National Broadband Network, the electronic spine, uh, the new electronic spine of Australia. And uh, Huawei appointed a local board which included former Foreign Minister uh, Alexander Downer and the former Labor Premier of uh, Victoria, Mr John Grumby. Um, uh, Huawei's uh, attempt to bid for the NBN was unsuccessful. Very, very interesting and wider implications than just Australia um, because of the security involvement of um, Chinese political activities in that company. Uh, there was a revolt in uh, the Australian body politic against Huawei's uh, uh, ability to, to invest. Um, uh, some of the policies of uh, uh, make the CCP's message the loudest of our times, which is uh, one of uh, uh, the Communist Party's proposals, is approach. Um, uh, the Xi era makes a strategy uh, which merges China's uh, traditional new media such as WeChat and takes it to new global audiences um, in developing uh, the world, uh, such as the former Eastern Bloc as well as developed countries. But it also takes place in uh, uh, countries like Australia. And it will surprise you to know that at the last federal election in Australia, one Chinese uh, social media, Weibo, was absolutely crucial in one election, in one House of Representatives seat. And um, the government of Australia hangs by one seat. So um, I'm not saying that the people who were suggesting to use Weibo um, knew that they would have this power, but it just shows you if you integrate all of this in uh, state apparatus activities, you can have uh, big, uh, a big influence. Um, under a policy known as borrow a vote to go out to the ocean, China has set up strategic partnerships with foreign newspapers, TV, radio stations to provide them with free content of CCP authorised uh, and China related news. The formerly uh, independent Chinese language media outside China is a key target for this activity. And it's the opinion of um, all of the academics in Australia who um, are, I must say this, they're not right wing, they're not conservative. These are all the left of centre academics who are very pro um, the Chinese ethnic community that 
all the newspapers, all the newspapers, all the Chinese media in Australia have been uh, bought by uh, Beijing interests. Uh, under localising policy, China's foreign media outlets such as uh, CGTV are employing more foreigners so as to have foreign faces explaining CCP policies. A new focus on the importance of think tanks in shaping policy and public opinion has also been very clear. China is making a massive investment in setting up scores uh, of China as well as foreign based think tanks and research centres. Um, I don't have to talk to you about the Confucius centres, but I'm talking about something deeper than that. There are, um, in particular in Sydney, there is one China aligned um, think tank, which I'm sure my friend Kinzong or others will uh, ask me questions about, uh, that is, uh, was set up by. Um, um, with the very big donations of, uh, of Beijing alone, uh, friendly businessmen who have uh, uh, seen since that it, it maintains a very strong uh, Beijing line. Um, I'm finishing up, so please uh, don't worry. Um, uh, under the slogan, uh, tell a good Chinese story, uh, restoring to prom uh, prominence China's cultural and uh, public diplomacy, uh, central and local governments are once again providing massive subsidies for cultural activities and uh, for also for the outside world, from scholarly publishing to acrobatics to Chinese medicine. This policy builds on and extends efforts uh, from the Hua, uh, Hu, uh, from the Hu Jintao era. Uh, uh, China promotes Chinese culture and language internationally through Confucius Institutes, cultural centres and festivities. Um, I return to One Belt, One Road. This is uh, Xi's uh, initiative uh, to create a China-centred economic bloc that is beyond ideology and will shape the global order. One Belt, One Road is also known as the Belt Road Initiative. Uh, builds on and greatly expands the, the going out to sea policy launched in 1999 in the Xiang era and continued into the uh, Hu Jintao era, which encouraged public-private partnerships between China's state-owned enterprises uh, and Chinese red capitalists in China and overseas to acquire uh, global natural resource assets and seek international infrastructure and projects. Now, of course, many of these could be, could be good. It's in the interests of many countries in, uh, in Asia, I can think of Indonesia, I can think of Timor, I can think even of Australia, to um, have good, proper commercial involvement uh, uh, by uh, Chinese companies and state-owned enterprises. It uh, we should be colour blind. Uh, we would, uh, I, uh, Australia was very opposed to those um, elements in Australian society who were opposed to Japanese investment in Australia in the past and we should encourage uh, and other countries should encourage Chinese investment provided it does not impinge on sovereignty. So an example in Australia would be that um, the port of Darwin is sold by uh, a really stupid local government, I'm sorry to be blunt, a um, hundred year lease for $500 million. A house in Darwin in 80 years time would be worth $5 million, the price of the entire lease of uh, that port. In contrast, in Victoria, we recently sold the port of Victoria so the government can build railway crossings and new roads and all of these kind of things with the money. They've got 9.7 billion uh, for a 50-year lease and um, Beijing interests were 25% of that arrangement. So you can have good commercial involvement uh, even by uh, Beijing interests provided it doesn't uh, influence your sovereignty. Um, now let me conclude by saying um, Australia's uh, uh, reactions uh, to this as an example of um, uh, the kind of uh, res responses we're making. First, in the military, um, uh, Australia has uh, a program which is an enormous program for us to build 12 uh, uh, long-range submarines as part of our new, uh, new Navy. Um, and it's a response like there is a response in Indonesia and Malaysia and other countries to this massive build-up by the PRC. Um, but there's also been a very strong reaction to this 
activities of the clumsy figures of the United Front Department in Beijing, who operate like a commie turn of all uh, in trying to influence a democratic system. So, uh, if not by the end of the year, because we've got a bit of political chaos in Australia, early next year, laws will be introduced to ban the donations, uh, foreign political donations to political parties. Now, my American friends or uh, uh, people from the United Kingdom might think this is very strange that we don't already have these laws, but we don't. Um, and uh, Beijing's uh, clumsy hands um, in trying to influence people to make statements supportive of the South China Sea uh, stance of China, uh, who happen to get a political donation or who happen to get their laundry paid for by uh, legal fees paid for by uh, Beijing. Uh, this, is, this has had a terrible effect uh, on that kind of activity. So it will lead to legislative changes and uh, I think that's got a, a very, uh, uh, very strong bipartisan support. Uh, interestingly, and I think there are many countries across the world who have to start thinking like we do, we have a, a, an organisation called the Foreign Investment Review Board. Any investment by any country, not focusing just on China, over $25 million has to be cleared by the Foreign Investment Review Board. So after the stupidity of selling uh, to Beijing interests the port of Darwin for 100 years for a mere $500 million, right next to the American Navy base that's there, um, the, the um, government appointed um, some serious people to this Foreign Investment Review Board. And uh, the good thing uh, is that since then, um, in New South Wales, there was a big electricity grid that was to be sold to, um, uh, again, a state-owned enterprise of Beijing. This uh, was banned by the Foreign Investment Review Board. Not because we're against uh, commercial investment and trade opportunities with China, but because with that electricity grid, it had some uh, links to uh, Australian uh, military and intelligence facilities, and it was thought too risky to give this company uh, the, the bid. So I would say to you, there are countries all around the world that are learning the lesson of the Port of Darwin. Um, don't do the Port of Darwin, do the Port of Melbourne. 25% big money, um, you have control of it, that's good. Um, giving away uh, your country, um, not good. Um, so my concluding point was, is that um, uh, the, there is bipartisan support in Australia for this uh, critical view of, uh, uh, of Beijing. We like to uh, maintain very good relations at a national level uh, with the government in Beijing because of course, uh, like many countries, China is our biggest trading partner. Uh, we're, in, we're happy to have uh, Chinese uh, investment in Australia, whether it's from Hong Kong or from Macau or from the mainland, um, provided it uh, is in both of our commercial interests, both of our business interests and doesn't impinge on serenity. And i conclude by saying that I have to thank um, some of the clumsy people from the Chinese Comintern, from the United Front Department, because their um, activities in interfering in Australian politics are going to lead to good changes that um, enhance uh, openness and transparency in our political system. And I believe uh, the same thing is happening around the world. If China pushes too hard inside uh, the domestic politics of democratic <coughs> countries, eventually people react and that's a good thing. Uh, we should do it without being hysterical. Um, legislative changes like the ones I've said to ban foreign political donations is uh, one small step but a very good step. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Danby. Uh, your speech is very clear and uh, detailed. Thank you, Danby.
，延展包括中国继续扩大，还有什么呃西藏问题，还有呃在在澳洲的威胁活动啊、呃。我有一个问题可以可以啊。啊 ，Can I have first question? Question. Oh, what's your question? I was looking. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to ask about the uh, port of Darwin, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, the, the port is very important to the world uh, strategy and the American Marine Corps is sta stationing there. And what China is uh, doing right now there? Um, it's, at the moment, there are, it's only a commercial uh, development, uh, but it's right next door to uh, this. Uh, military facility, and um, it's uh, uh, very strange. Um, you wouldn't uh, um, have a uh, Chinese commercial facility built right next door to 7th Fleet in Yokohama. Um, you wouldn't have one um, built uh, right next door to American facilities in Guam. So. Um, the Director General of the Australian uh, uh, Intelligence Service said that, oh, it's not a problem if uh, um, we discover they they uh, are doing something wrong there, we'll pick them out. Um, but Australia is a law-based society. When someone has got a commercial uh, lease, uh, we can't operate like Beijing does when they don't like McDonald's in Beijing and they kick them out so they can sell the uh, the building to some Taiwanese uh, property developer. Um, uh, we don't have the Beijing uh, uh, Communist Party uh, in Australia. We have the rule of law. If they've got a contract, it's a problem. So um, uh, it's an issue that we have to deal with in the, in the future. But um, uh, this is a problem throughout Asia. I just warn you all that in Indonesia, in Malaysia, um, in other places, uh, there are similar kinds of initiative and pushing. So we have to uh, um, see this example of the stupidity in Darwin as a, a lesson for people all around the world. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please. Uh, hi, I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, do you agree that China seems to uh, doing a silent invasion to Australia, particularly in education and political sector? The second question is, do you agree that uh, Australia government is bringing to solve GPLC in the past period of time? Good question. Um, so, uh I think it's a, a mistake to use words like invasion. Um, uh, Asylum law. Well, yeah. Um, first of all, um, I think it's a good thing uh, that we all share education. I like Australians going to America. I like Chinese coming to Australia. I like people from Hong Kong or Malaysia coming to Australia. The question is um, uh, that uh, young people shouldn't be put under pressure by foreign embassies. So um, if uh, Beijing keeps doing this in Australia, they will find that at a certain point, people will push back very hard. There has already been um, some wonderful articles exposing this by um, uh, smaller liberal professors who speak up on behalf of their uh, uh, students from China who say that they shouldn't be put under pressure from uh, 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 Beijing Embassy. The Beijing Embassy does have very close liaison, as you know, with uh, Chinese student societies. This is something that they do in the United States, that they do in England, they do all around the world. Um, and um, there has been a series by a young person um, who you should be in contact with called Alex Josky, who just has a lot of Chinese friends in uh, the Australian National University. And Mr Josky has been writing articles in the newspapers about the pressure that his friends from the mainland have been under 
by the embassy um, and how it's unfair and how young people who are studying shouldn't have uh, the uh, thumbs put on them by uh, 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 people from home. So that's very good because being exposed in the, the media takes some of the pressure off um, and it's very good that Australians who are not young people from uh, mainland China or Hong Kong are aware of this. Having said that, it's very unfair that um, I just read today that uh, one of the sons of a very important uh, human rights lawyer in uh, Beijing was stopped at the airport in, Be in Beijing on his way to Australia to study and his passport torn up in front of his eyes um, because the state security said that his uh, parents were a uh, danger to state security and he wasn't being allowed to study in Australia because of that. Um, we must find a way to answer these kinds of uh, 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 crudities. Thank you, Mr. Tembi, for your talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, Chinese influence and uh, the small step but important step you have taken to pass the legislation banning China's money. I think money, follow money, you'll follow the truth. And my question is, um, the recent actually ongoing debate and discussion in Australia about China's influence, um, where it will lead to, how likely Australia will pass the legislation uh, the Magnitsky type legislation, the Global Magnitsky Accountability uh, Bill Act passed by US and Canada last uh, month, and how likely that will be introduced in the past in the Australian Parliament? That's a, a very good question. Sometimes American and Canadian models don't work in Australia, simply because uh, it's introduced in the United States. Many people resist because they don't want to be seen to be imitative of uh, uh, legislation in the United States. So um, uh, I think um, such legislation might be put up by someone like me as a private member's bill, uh, but um, I'm not sure that it will be voted on. Okay, That's not to say that... Um, um, there shouldn't be uh, uh, special kinds of legislation to, uh, to cover this. And I must say the best way to, to handle these kinds of interferences uh, by Beijing is not to be um, focusing just on um, Chinese business, Chinese students. Uh, you must make it non-discriminatory. So we have to, when we do this, no foreign donations legislation, it's not focused only on um, Beijing. Anyone, uh, Philippines, um, Japanese, um, English, American, it's not just not legitimate for foreigners to give donations to political parties for elections. It's, it's uh, crazy Australians should do that themselves, not, not, not foreigners. So you make it, uh, this legislation uh, non-discriminatory. And I think uh, I'm very pleased that particularly the changes to the Foreign Investment Review Board. Um, a friend of mine who is the former ambassador to Beijing, uh, Mr. David Irvine, he's a lovely old grandfather. He's a very wise, you know, you, in all societies you have um, older people who have a certain wisdom and a certain uh, strength. And he, since he's been on this Foreign Investment Review Board, he has seen that there are fair decisions made with regards to China. So there's no to Osgrid, yes to the Port of Melbourne. Um, and he will uh, see that without discrimination, there's no influence on sovereignty as far as we're concerned. A very important uh, uh, distinction. Uh, but I have to say the whole, whole issue um, leads to um, very surprising things. I never thought I would hear that the Labour Party, my party, will support the quadrilateral 
initiative, uh, uh, Japan, India, the United States and Australia. So it's because of uh, pushback to Beijing's hard line that it leads other countries to take a more uh, uh, thoughtful and more reach out to other people. Um, particularly in, uh, for American allies uh, like Japan and Australia in the era of President Trump, we have to make sure we all work together um, because we're not as sure of uh, President Trump or Mr. Bannon as we are of previous uh, American uh, administrations. That's not to criticise them, it's just to say that they're more unpredictable. Uh, we, you know, uh, we're not sure what they're, uh, they're going to do next. Um, well, we might hear about it on Twitter. Is this question to be Bannon? I think we should ask Mr. Bannon that, yeah. Uh, look, uh, the, the, the current American administration's ability to be a bit unpredictable is good, um, uh, but it shouldn't be crazy. Um, so, um, if you can do the, the line somewhere between those two, I have to tell you, we in Australia were very unimpressed by uh, the previous American administration of President Obama and Secretary Kerry's complete disinterest in Asia. Um, we, this, all of, many of the problems in this part of the world are because of um, uh, Obama Kerry um, letting the North Korean situation keep going, their neglect of the South China Sea. Uh, their uh, neglect of, uh, uh, of allies. We shouldn't be in this position. Uh, now we've got, um, being as diplomatic as I can, a more unpredictable person um, who was there um, uh, as a reaction to this. So that's my answer. Sorry, it's a long answer. Hi, Mr. Dending. I'm Doris Bill from Canada. I just played my documentary here, so I'll just sit there. Um, my question is, of course, why I'm very interested in um, focusing on. You just mentioned, you also mentioned Confucius Institute. You seem to know very well about uh, the CCP's uh, strategies and hard, soft, uh, hard and soft power. So uh, back in 2010, there were um, your colleagues said, no, no, it's in New South Wales, the state level, not the, the country level. So there were um, members of MLA, it's called yes. MLA yeah. in, in, in Australia. State parliamentary. Yes. Like from the Georgia State Legislature. Yeah, state yeah. There were uh, like Liberal and Green Party uh, MLAs, they, um, uh, they kind of raised, wanted to uh, uh, ask the New South Wales um, state government, uh, government to kick out all the Confucius uh, classrooms which uh, are embedded in the Australian uh, schools, like new, uh, high schools. So uh, they collected over 20,000 signatures in Sydney, in Sydney only, uh, which is uh, against the Confucius Institute and classrooms. But unfortunately, the motion wasn't passed. So my question is, uh, what uh, is your view on this particular issue? Because uh, recently there are so many articles talking about the right the infiltration into Australian universities in a higher education level. So what is your um, opinion toward this issue? And why do you think the Australian government country like national level and state level, what should they do to uh, yeah, address this issue? Thank you. Uh, those, those people were, were unsuccessful. There are now 14 Confucius Institutes in Australia. And um, the answer is money. Um, the universities perceive uh, that uh, Beijing um, would like to enhance its cultural um, soft power in Australia uh, via these Confucius Institutes and that Beijing offers the money to do that um, and they don't perceive that this has any hard political influence or is restriction on learning in, in other areas. That's, that's a certain view. Let me tell you two things that happened. 
the um, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, that's the highest official in Australia, not a government minister, uh, Francis Adamson, who was our uh, representative in Taiwan many years ago when I first met her. She went to Confucius Institute and she gave a speech, you, you should all read it, about how Beijing must not interfere in Australian universities and must not use Confucius Institute. I was very surprised. She's a very mild woman, very nice person. I've never heard her say something so strong. Um, so, the, again, if you push too hard, eventually you'll get pushback. So that speech is very important. There's also another thing that happened that surprised me. Um, uh, academic um, Fitzgerald, um, professor, wrote a, a wonderful article called um, Red Pen Through Our Universities. And uh, again, in the same newspaper which published China Daily, he had front cover with a big red X about what um, uh, some Chinese uh, uh, activities are trying to influence uh, academic learning in Australia. So, uh, the Secretary of the Department makes a speech at the Confucius Institute. They're all sitting there and she tells them um, you know, not, not to interfere. That's good. I'm not saying it's, it's the perfect answer. And the fact that the academics are right, I will, I'll get you a copy of um, Professor Fitzgerald's three-page article called uh, The Red Pen Through Australian Learning. It's a very... Uh, he used to work for a RAND corporation in the United States, and he's a, uh, it's, a, it's an article that is um, setting the kind of behaviour in all universities, not just Australian universities, could be anywhere in Europe and Asia. Um, so, so there's an answer to this. It didn't come via the New South Wales State Parliamentarians, but there are answers that people are giving academics. He's not the only one who's written on this, there are many others. And uh, um, Ms Adamson's uh, very surprising speech. There's a lady here. So the last one, last question.
band network. Now, this is a like I'm talking about a fifty billion dollar deal, mm -hmm. which is big anywhere, including in Australia. Fifty billion. They would have been allowed to control all of the communications in Australia. So, um, <coughs> very stupidly, they appeared before my committee. The, we, I was a member of the Intelligence Committee. And we asked many questions, which were in the Economist magazine. Is it true there is a Communist Party cell which controls Huawei? Well, we knew the answer to that already. When you're a good barrister, you always ask questions you know the answer to. Um, so, uh, uh, is it true that um, the chairman of Huawei was um, in uh, military engineering department, uh, full colonel? Again, I knew the answer to that before I asked it. But they appeared before our committee and they just had no answers. They, had, they thought they were coming for public relations, but they made a terrible mistake. Um, never appear before... Um, uh, Democratic political uh, parliamentary committees, unless you, uh, you you know what you're doing, um, so they, they manifestly didn't. I didn't tell you one other thing too, and I'll, I'll conclude with this just to show you that we're watching all of these kind of things. One of the ways Beijing tries to influence people in uh, business, in particular, is uh, what they call the pro program of hunt the foxes. Um, so. Uh, uh, they were, uh, a Premier League fund came to Australia and thought he had a promise from Foreign Minister uh, Julie Bishop that we'll pass a law allowing people to be extradited from Australia to Beijing. No. Uh, she promised him, he came, and three days later, uh, uh, the committee, the Joint Committee on Treaties, which I just happened to be the Deputy Chairman of, um, said no. Uh, and the Senate said no. Because we don't want to extradite people to uh, China where there are 3,000 executions uh, uh, last year. Um, Australia doesn't extradite people to any country where there's capital punishment. Um, and uh, our committee said, and the parliament accepted, over the head of the Australian government, uh, that um, we don't believe that there is enough law-based society in China that people who will be extradited from Australia will have a fair trial. Um, and in my speech I said that there are, uh, uh, of the uh, one million cases that were in China the previous year, only 200 people were found uh, uh, innocent. So uh, it's not the statistics we have in any other country. So um, there's no extradition treaty to uh, uh, to China because the Australian Parliament reacted to fears that people who are business people will be extradited to China, and that this will create pressure on them and Chinese Australians if uh, Beijing will have the ability to extradite. Thank you very much, everybody.